Hi everyone. Today we're going to read the next section of Rat's Caliber by Josh Lieb for the Gilbert Library's Winter Reading. Here we go. Chapter 15. The crow didn't fly far. With a yell, Sir Aramis leaped from the roof, grabbed hold of one of the bird's legs, and hacked at the other with his sword. The black claw squawked and dropped his lean onto the rooftop. It squawked again bitterly, clearly annoyed at losing the princess, then grabbed hold of Sir Aramis before he could get away too. The black claw flew high into the air, clutching the vizier who continued hammering away at it with his sword. Aramis was shouting at the bird, but whatever he was saying, they couldn't hear it on the roof. The cats were up on their hind legs, leaping and hissing and stretching their paws out to the crow, pumping their limbs like they were trying to swim up through the air to rescue Sir Aramis. But they couldn't even get close, and they kept falling helplessly to the roof. Thump, thump, thump. Only Aramis's own cat, Maeve, remained still. She sat on her haunches and stared calmly up at the furious battle taking place above her head. She was probably the only cat smart enough to know that that was all she could do. It was all Joey could do either. He didn't know exactly what a vizier's job was, but he'd never imagined this. Aye, said Parsifer, who was standing next to him. Aramis was one of our bravest knights, till he decided his time was better spent holding the king's hand. How did you know what I was thinking, said Joey. Parsifer laughed, but he didn't sound happy. It's no great chore to read your face. Then he continued, as he stared up at the vizier, Aramis taught me everything I know. I was his squire. You don't seem to get along now, said Joey. Parsifer spat on the ground. I am of the opinion that a knight should fight, not play politics in the king's court. He giggled, but his eyes looked deadly serious as they stared up at Aramis. But perhaps braver rats make better choices. The battle raged on. Aramis kept jabbing the crow with his sword, but to no effect. Every few moments, the crow would try to fly higher into the air, but it kept bumping into something. Something invisible, as far as Joey could see, and doing a weird little flip. Why is it flying like that? asked Joey. Brutilda, solemnly gnawing on her broadsword, grunted. The princess has it on a leash. Joey looked at Yisleen. She was waving her paws in front of her face and muttering something under her breath as she stared at the crow. Joey understood. This was tragic. Couldn't she do anything more? She could stop the crow's heart, said Parsifer, but a fall from that height, trapped in a black claw's death grip, would be difficult to survive. If the fall didn't kill Aramis, the weight of the bird might. Or a talon might pierce his heart, said Brutilda. I nodded Parsifer. This is the wisest course. Eventually the black claw will grow frustrated and drop Sir Aramis. This was the first time Joey had heard Parsifer call the vizier Sir Aramis. All the princess can do is make sure he doesn't fall too far. As if on cue, the crow gave up and opened its claws. Aramis fell soundlessly through the air, past the roof, down to the street below. There's a little thud on the roof near Joey, but he was too worried about Aramis to wonder what it was. He ran to the edge of the roof and looked down. To his relief, he saw that the vizier had fallen on what looked like a nice, soft pile of trash in a narrow alleyway. He lay flat on his back, not moving. But even from here, Joey could see that he was breathing. Probably just stunned, said Parsifer, as he jumped on to Checkers. I'll go down and fetch him. The crow took one last look at the fallen knight, then flew away with a disgusted squawk. Joey glanced over at Yisleen. She had collapsed with exhaustion. That was the thud Joey had heard, and Brutilda was trying to get her to sip water from an acorn cap. Parsifer, riding checkers, leaped onto the building's fire escape and started trotting down the steps. Joey looked down. Aramis had raised himself up on an elbow and was looking around, a little dazed, but he seemed to be okay. Joey was relieved. Then Joey looked at the pile of garbage Aramis was lying on. It seemed familiar. He had definitely seen it before. Maybe not from this angle. He turned his head and squinted. Just as a little tickle of hot spice ran his, its fingers up his nose. Something clicked in Joey's brain. Rundle, he whispered. That's Rundle's den. Then suddenly he shouted at the top of his lungs. Sir Aramis is on top of Rundle's den. He looked back down. Aramis was still dazed, absolutely helpless. The garbage bang he was lying on 
rippled as if blown by a breeze no one could feel, or as if something was moving beneath it. Chapter 16 Yah! shouted Parsifer without a moment's hesitation, kicking Checker's sides with his heels. The cat leaped off the fire escape obediently, falling a full three stories onto the garbage pile, right next to Aramis and somersaulting forward. Only at that moment did Rundle's savage orange arm stab out of the pile, but Parsifer, who had been thrown by the fall, stabbed back with his trusty sharpened paper clip. Rundle's paw disappeared into the pile with a scream. Before it could reappear, Parsifer had leaped back onto Checkers, pulled Aramis up behind him, and ridden away. A few minutes later, Checkers, carrying the two rats, climbed back onto the roof. Both knights looked exhausted by the recent ordeal, but Sir Aramis had recovered his senses enough to speak. I owe you my life, good Parsifer, said the vizier with dignity. Parsifer gave a significant look to Yuseline, who was now able to stand without Brutilda's help, and said, We owe you far more than that. Aramis waved the compliment away with a dismissive gesture, as if saving the life of a princess was something he did every day. Your Majesty, he said, turning to Yuseline, in light of this recent ordeal, please reconsider going on this quest. I worry. Losing you would be the end of your father. But the princess, though shaken, was as stubborn as ever. Losing his kingdom would be the end of my father, she said. Aramis had to nod regretfully. She smiled and hugged him and gave him a grateful kiss on the cheek. Don't worry, old, fe old fellow. My companions will keep me safe. Aramis didn't look too sure about that, but he hugged her back. Then nodded stiffly to the others and mounted his cat to return to his king. He trotted away, giving several worried glances back as he left. The princess turned to the others. Let us make haste. There is much riding to do today. The others mounted their cats and followed her down the fire escape onto the street around the corner from Rundell. Parsifer leaned for toward Joey and whispered, We'll not ride far before we make camp. Ragic is exhausting, especially for one as young as Lazine. She needs to sleep soon. Joey nodded, though it was taking all his concentration to hold on to the Squamish as she padded down the fire escape. He felt like he was riding a slinky downstairs. It was broad daylight, and there were plenty of people on the street, but no one paid any attention to the strange caravan winding down the sidewalk. Why don't they see us? asked Joey. It's the basic agic, said Brutilda, as if he were an idiot. Everyone knows that. Tut, tut, your roundness, said Parsifer. The boy was a high realmer only yesterday. He can't be expected to know such things. Brutilda sniffed and looked away. Parsifer said to Joey, All those who work agic, whether they be regicians, squadricians, dogicians, raccoonicians, that's raccoon magicians, said Joey. Parsifer nodded. They all have an interest in keeping our world, the low realm, hidden from yours. So, whatever else they do with their powers, there's a basic adjective they do at all times. Every second that they breathe, that clouds our realm from human eyes. High realmers can see individual pieces of the puzzle, a cat here, a rat there, but a rat riding a cat? Never. That's why Gondorf had to turn you into a rat to send his message. You never would have seen us otherwise. And when they do stumble upon one of us, they say, after we've died in battle, what do they find? Nothing. Take me, for example. The human who chances to find my corpse will me merely see a rat, a peanut shell, and a paperclip. Nothing suspicious there. Aside, of course, from my outstanding physical beauty. <laughs> Joy realized it had been a long time since he'd heard Parsifer giggle. He was kind of glad to hear the noise, but something still didn't make sense. Okay, but why are we traveling on the sidewalk at all? Shouldn't we be in the sewer? Wouldn't that be faster and safer? Isn't that where rats live? Brutilda, riding ahead of them, snorted. There's nothing safe about the under realm, said, and the only thing it would make faster is our deaths. She spat a loogie onto the sidewalk. Allow me to translate what my ovoid friend has put so bluntly, said Parsifer. The under realm, or sewer as you refer to it, is inhabited by wild rats. Savages who have never mastered cats or ragic or weapons. They have spears, interrupted Brutelda. Except for the crude spears they throw, 
Thank you, Brutilda, he said in a way that didn't sound like thank you at all. They're content to lurk in the dark and steal whatever they can find and kill whomever they can meet. They have no leaders, no kings, no civilization, no honor. What they have are numbers. There are lots and lots of them. Any civilized animal that finds itself in the Underrealm doesn't last very long. Joey shivered. He was suddenly very glad to be on the sidewalk in bright sunlight. He just wished they could go faster. Mom must be so worried. Brutilda suddenly took hold of the reins of Yisleen's cat and brought it to a halt. She turned back to the others. We must stop here for the night, she said, leaving no room for argument. The princess must rest. Nonsense, Brutilda. I'm fine, said Yisleen. But even Joey, who barely knew her, could see that she wasn't. She was leaning sideways in her saddle, like she could fall asleep any second. They found a ventilation shaft, an aluminum tunnel full of hot air beneath a pizza parlor and crawled inside, while the cats stayed outside and guarded the entrance. It was cozy and warm, and the air was filled with the luxurious smell of fresh pizza. It suddenly occurred to Joey that he was starving. I didn't even realize how hungry I was, he said to Parsifer. Aye, said the knight, tightening his belt. There's no diet like fear, but have no worries. We'll raid the establishment above us once it closes for the night. Yisleen was already asleep on a bed of cloth and straw that Brutilda had laid out for her. The giant guinea pig guarding the princess sat upright on her mammoth haunches. Joey felt sorry for anyone who tried to get past her. Joey nudged Parsifer to point to Brutilda. What's her story? he whispered. I have ears, said Brutilda. Joey had forgotten how well rodents could hear. Take no offense, O bulbous one, giggled Parsifer. The boy's curiosity is only natural. Fair Brutilda is an escapee from what you would call a... He hesitated. Now what's the term? Kindergarten class, hissed Brutilda. Chapter 17 Joey was confused. He had never heard the word kindergarten spoken with such loathing. Yes, kidney gordon class, repeated Parsifer, saying it all wrong. As I understand it, it is a place where immature humans are herded together until they can be of use to the adult colony. Well, it's something like that, said Joey. It was the fingers that got to me, said Brutilda. All those filthy human children pushing their rude fingers through the bars, poking at me, prodding me, day after day after day. Brutilda kept talking, but she didn't look at Joey or Parsifer. It was like she was lost in some unhappy memory inside her mind. And the stuff that was on those fingers, the dirt and the paint and the paste and the boogers. She stopped talking and licked her mouth for a long second. Well, that part was wonderful, obviously, but I realized I was meant for greater things than being trapped in a cage forever. You escaped, said Joey. I escaped, said Brutilda. One night I pushed open my cage door, hid myself in the garbage can and ran away when the janitor took it out in the morning. She paused. There was one little girl who used to push gummy bears into my cage. I do feel bad about abandoning her. Brutilda looked down at Princess Yasleen, sleeping next to her. But I was destined for more important tasks. So you just decided to become a rat? Brutilda turned a withering glare on Joey. Life must seem so simple when you're so simple. Persifer interjected. Fair, Tilda. Didn't just decide anything. She wandered homeless for quite some time, nearly starved to death. She only weighed about a million pounds, as I recall. Brutilda scowled, but Parsifer continued, and when I first saw her, she was about to be slaughtered by a pack of marauding underwhelmers. You were there? asked Joey. Aye, said Parsifer. There was a rabid raccoon threatening our southern trade route with piecemeal. It was part of a hunting party Uther led to end the threat. We were on our way home, exhausted from the quest, when we chanced upon the Lady Brutilda cornered by underwhelmers in an alley and verging on death. Some of you wanted to let them kill me, said Brutilda. Correction, O oh furry sphere, all of us did, said Parsifer, except Uther, of course. We were wounded ourselves in no shape for combat. If the underwhelmers wanted to slay some monster they'd found, here Brutilda stiffened. What business of it was ours? He he he. But noble Luther never saw a battle he wasn't worth fighting, or a maiden that wasn't worth saving, 
and he was right, of course. He always was. Ravalon's never had a doier offender, defender than our Brutilda. He saved me, said Brutilda, with her eyes back on the princess. He saved me when the whole world had turned its back. There was a long silence. Your conversation sparkles as always, my silky cow, said Parsifer before turning to Jolie. We should sleep while we can. You sleep, I'll stand watch, said Brutilda. Of course you will, said Parsifer. I wasn't talking to you. He he he. Joey did feel tired. He curled up on the ground, but guilt soon began to gnaw at him. Are you sure it's okay to rest? Relax, little savior, said Parsifer. Brutilda will wake us up if we get an unexpected visitor. Maybe, said a very deep voice, or maybe the unexpected visitor will wake you up himself. Joey jumped to his paws and looked to see who was talking. Somehow a rat had snuck up on them. And that seemed impossible because this rat was enormous, nearly the size of Brutilda, but all rat. His fur was pitch black and stuck out in sharp, jagged spikes that made him look even bigger. Long white fangs curved down from his upper jaw. Joey had seen fangs like that before in drawings of saber-toothed tigers. The colossal rat squatted in the entrance to the duct they were hiding in, nearly blocking the whole thing. Joey realized with a shiver that this meant the big rat was squatting in the exit to the duct, too. Their only way out was through this rat. Chapter 18 The big black rat looked as solid as a wall. More solid walls didn't have fangs or claws. Now, how, asked Parsifer, acting very cool. Indeed, did you get past the cats? I have a way with cats, said the giant rat. Brutilda moved carefully forward, putting her body between the visitor and the princess. If you're looking for a place to sleep, keep moving. This den is occupied. The giant shook his massive head. I'm not looking for a place to sleep. I'm looking for you. I see, said Brutilda as she pulled her massive long sword from her back. Parsifer stepped forward so that he stood side by side with Brutilda. We're not in the mood for guests at the moment. It might be safest for all parties, he said, drawing his paperclip sword from his side, especially you, for you to move on. The giant didn't even blink. Compared to his bar bulk, Persifer's sword might as well have been a hair plucked from an anemic flea. Don't pick a fight you can't win, he said. He didn't say it meanly, it was just a statement of fact. Parsifer's merry eyes darted to the sleeping princess. Oh, this is a fight I have to win. And don't worry, I will. I always do. He he he. The giant rat looked at Parsifer for a second, then leaned backward a little and started shaking. A low rumbling noise bounced off the aluminum walls of the duct like rolling thunder. It took Joey a second to figure out what it was. Laughter. The giant rat was laughing back at Sir Parsifer and his big laugh was completely drowning out Parsifer's brave squeak. The little white rat's smile suddenly seemed a little forced. Joey looked again at Princess Yasleen, who still lay sleeping, completely defenseless. He thought of the squidition he had to find in order to get changed back, and he thought of Mom, waiting for him to get home. He knew what he had to do, though he could barely believe he was going to do it. He pulled out Rat's caliber, it felt cool in his clammy hand and stepped forward to join Parsifer and Brutilda. We don't want any trouble, said Jolie, but we're not afraid to fight either. If this is your home, I'm sorry. We'll be gone tomorrow. But for now, we're staying here, he said, holding Rat's caliber high, whether you like it or not. The giant stopped laughing and took a step forward, then another. He was like a tank with arms and legs. Joey could see the rat's muscles rippling under his coarse fur. He seemed completely unafraid of Joey and Brutilda and Parsifer. He opened his coal black eyes wide, stuck his head forward, and stared Joey straight in the face. Now, Honcho, said the big rat, is that any way to greet your favorite uncle? Chapter 19 It took Joey a second to figure out what was happening. It took him another second to believe it was true. Uncle Patrick? he said at last. The giant rat laughed again and held out his arms for a hug. 
Joey rushed forward, and he suddenly found himself wrapped up in the, the Patrick Rat's strong arms. The fur that had looked so spiky and scary was warm and soft. It even kind of smelled like Uncle Patrick, too. Like sweat. Which smelled just about right for a giant rat. Joey pulled himself free and looked at Parsifer and Brutilda. They were staring at Joey like he had just chewed off his own paw. Sir Parsifer, Brutilda, this is my Uncle Patrick. Brutilda recovered her senses and sniffed. Another High Realmer? This kingdom has truly fallen on dark days. But Parsifer just giggled, like usual. Joey was very happy to see his uncle, but very confused to see him as a rat. But, but how? Patrick chuckled. Your friend Gondorf was not as dead as you probably thought. Parsifer surged forward. Gondorf lives? Is it true? Patrick stopped chuckling. No, I'm sorry, no. He woke up just long enough to tell me what he had done to Joey, so I asked him to turn me into a rat too because... Uncle Patrick scratched the fur behind Joey's ears. Well, because I kind of like Joey and want to make sure he's safe, and so Gondorf changed me, and I'm grateful. But the effort was too much for him. He's dead now. But are you sure? I checked, said Patrick. Everyone was silent for a little while. It felt kind of cruel to, to be given the hope that Gondorf might be alive, just to find out he was really dead after all. At least Joey wasn't alone here anymore. So he started talking. He started telling Uncle Patrick everything. It felt good to tell someone about all the crazy things he'd been doing. Someone who would understand just how crazy these things were. Joey talked fast, nonstop, barely taking a breath. The words just spilled out of him. Uncle Patrick didn't even try to interrupt or ask a question. But when Joey was finally done, Uncle Patrick gave him a serious look and said, That's amazing, Joey, but I think there is probably something you want to ask me. Joey realized that there was something he wanted to ask Uncle Patrick, but something he was scared to ask too. He didn't want to know the answer. That's why he'd been talking so much, so fast, so he wouldn't have to ask the question. Now he was all out of words, and the question was the only thing left to say. How's mom? Chapter 20. Mom sat on the couch. She had her cell phone in her lap and the landline on the table next to her. There was no noise in the apartment except for the sound of street traffic outside. She didn't have the TV or the radio on. She didn't want there to be any noise in case, of the t in case one of the telephones started to ring. But they didn't ring. Mom wasn't crying because she never did that. But she was breathing very slowly, in and out, in and out. She was all alone. She didn't know anyone in the city except for Patrick, and now Patrick was missing too. The police had left an hour ago. They had dusted for fingerprints and examined the bars on Joey's window, but there really wasn't much they could do. They promised her they would call as soon as they found out anything. Mom could see in their eyes that they thought that Joey must be with Patrick. Maybe they had gone to a movie or something and had just forgot to tell her. Joey must be with Patrick, thought Mom but she didn't really believe it. Why would either of them, Joey or Patrick, just dis disappear like that? Mom caught a look at herself in the mirror. Her red hair was clumped like a crazy curly nest on top of her head. It's what happened when she didn't brush her hair. She looked like a crazy person. So Mom stood up and decided that she wouldn't be crazy anymore. She went into the bathroom and brushed her hair, then put on some clean clothing and did the dishes. She decided to make some coffee. That was a normal thing for her to do. Then she remembered that the coffee maker was on the floor in Joey's room. She went to get it. She walked quickly so she wouldn't think about where she was going. But when she bent down to pick up the coffee pot, her eyes landed briefly on the hamster cage next to Joey's bed. The rat was still in there. Mom walked over to the cage. The gray rat was curled up dead in the corner. She took the cage. She shook the cage, but the rat didn't move. She looked closely. The rat wasn't breathing. She pulled the rat out of the cage, and it was cold in her hands. It was dead, dead, dead. For some reason, that made her sadder than almost anything. She knew she had to get the rat out of her house immediately, so she carried it by the tail, out the door, and down the hallway. With all the neighbors staring at her, she went to the garbage can that stood on the sidewalk outside her window 
lifted the lid, and dropped the rat. Her tears fell like fat raindrops onto its dull gray fur. Then she put the lid back on, made herself stop crying, and went back into the apartment to wait by the phone. But where was the phone? She'd left it somewhere. In a panic, she searched the living room, the kitchen, under the sofa cushions. Then she went into Joey's room. There it was, on the bedside table, next to the hamster cage. It was only after she'd picked up the phone that she saw the message, scratched in tiny letters in the dust on the tabletop. I'm bringing him back. There were paw prints leading away from it. And that's where we're going to stop for today. I hope to see you next time. Bye.